is the go live button and 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 um where's that green light that tells me i'm live and we are live so welcome everybody we finally made it so this is the most anticipated live stream this year uh obviously we're not lying so um of course we get straight into the uh business of our, our live stream have a very big welcome to Sven vandenberg um he's uh, awkward looking the door <laughs> but uh welcome Swift. thank you for joining us and um yeah it's uh it's really exciting to bring aboard some pretty high profile stars people actually know what they're talking about most of the time so uh, i'm very happy to have you here swift and thank you very much for joining us yeah no problem at all mm. thank you for featuring uh, me and also my channel and your channel Absolutely. So for those, those who don't know, like the, the five of you don't know who Swift is, uh, he is a, a Dutch national shooter. He's been very, very active uh, on the world scene. Also very active behind the scenes, especially with the World Archery channel. I think we, I think Swift and I have had a lot of friendly chats in the live streams. By the way, yeah. it, and I think right now, I think the indoor and Nimes is streaming. If you're not watching us, you should be watching them. But uh, if you're not watching them, you should be watching us right now. So um, this is a, a very good, op a very great opportunity to have Swift on board because because um, he has a lot more experience than I have in the archery scene. So it's great to have him, and uh, we've got some really good questions lined up, and hopefully we'll get a lot more going um, as we uh, progress. So as usual, guys, if you are watching this and you have any questions, feel free to throw questions in chat. Um, if you want to make it easy for me, just tag new senseis. So I can see my name light up on my screen. Uh, but hopefully, as you uh, want to join us in our conversation, um, any questions you have, just just ask, and we'll we'll divert and we'll uh, we'll go. A uh, little freestyle. So, um, I guess we'll go straight to the questions. Um, as with most guests in our, in our channel, uh, it's great to hear origin stories. We love sharing this, but often we don't get a chance to just talk about ourselves. But here we are with Swift. So, um, how, how, what, is, what is your origin story? How did you get into archery? And uh, like, what's, what's your pathway? Like, what's the story? Um, so, I'm, I'm first going to start off by completely breaking down your... Uh... <laughs> your whole uh, structure and saying uh, everybody who's watching just uh, in the comments give Yap uh, some good luck notes because uh, Yap is going to shoot a recurve competition today one yes. of his uh, first <laughs> so, <laughs> I saw that he's in the chat so uh, he'll probably read it if you uh, if you're wishing good luck and now I'm gonna get get it to the live stream uh, so yeah how did I get into archery it's actually a good question um, I have answered this in my own live streams but uh, um, I started when I was very young, when I was four years old. Um, I was constantly uh, asking my dad if I could join to the club uh, because he was already doing archery and I was like asking him uh, again and again uh, up until a point where he said, okay, you can join and then uh, yeah, after that it's done. Uh, but it wasn't done after that. I kept going and I kept uh, joining to the club and then uh, I sort of got, got stuck in the whole archery game. So yeah, at a very young age, I got addicted to archery. So uh, that was your, your first step, and I, I imagine you you went to a club. Did you do some beginner program first, or like what was your first steps? Like we didn't really have beginner programs for, especially for four year olds. Um, <laughs> right, that's so, uh, all right. right. Yeah. So so pretty much, um, I got a bow, and uh, my dad uh, helped hold it because I couldn't hold it by myself. It was like a 68 inch bow and I was, it was probably twice the length of myself. Um, so yeah, I, um, uh, I just started shooting uh, with the help of my dad and, uh, I, uh, yeah, got into it uh, that way. All right. So I imagined going from like four years old to like, um, you know, Olympic level, there's there are a few steps in between, right? So like, what's the pathway? How'd you go from your first, like experience in archery to where you are now um obviously there's a lot of things that happened in between um i think for the first maybe seven years of my shooting i didn't even think about uh, archery at a high level i just uh i did archery because i liked it and uh, because my like my my um uh, what is it? My friends and, and the, the people of my same age were just doing it as well. So I was, uh, I was just being one of the kids. And then 
uh, after I started winning the club championships, um, pretty much any time we held a competition, I would I would win it. And then um, somebody came up to me and asked, like, don't you want to go to like a regional training and uh, like a talent uh, scouting training? I was like, sure, <laughs> because I thought it was just another training. And then things started rolling. Like I um, I went to a regional training and then I went to like a bigger region uh, of which we have four in the Netherlands. And then uh, eventually when I was 15, I got uh, into the, the youth team of the Netherlands. And then, uh, yeah, when I was 16, I was in the senior team. So went very fast from there. Well, wow. and um, so speaking of which, like you've always been, you've, you've been to a lot of um, major world events. Like what were some of the, the major events and milestones you've been through? Um, so probably the, the thing that kicked it off for me um, was the European Games in Baku. And that was where I first got like uh, individual success, basically. So the, that was in 2015 and I got silver in the European Games. Um, and that was like a moment for me where I thought, hmm, I'm, I'm more than just a, a good qualification shooter. I can actually do this knockout thing as well. Um, because up until that point, like I had shot a junior world records uh, and stuff like that, like uh, all in qualification, but I hadn't done anything impressive uh, knockout wise. And then I shot that competition and that sort of made something happen in my, uh, in my head. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much how I, uh, how I got into. And then, uh, from there, I, it was just a year, uh, until Rio and, uh, and then Shanghai before that. So I won my first world cup in 2016 and then, uh, yeah, went into, uh, the, the Olympics with, uh, pretty much on high. So yeah, that's, I think that's the, the most logical way to explain it. Yeah, well, that's, that's beautiful. So. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so basically shoot really good and then get picked for your team. Is that basically it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Just um, and, and, and start off at a level where you can compete with other people that are at the same level. You don't necessarily have to shoot very good to be competitive. You can also be competitive against your club mates if that's what your, your challenge is. Mm. And then, uh, yeah. so, yeah, there is multiple ways of uh, enjoying the sport. Mm, great. We've got a quick question from chat the moment. We've got a uh, Mayank Singh. So, I don't, not sure you might remember this, but what pound bow did you start with? And I think it's referring to when you just started. <laughs> so, you want to be six year old to start, apparently. So, what, what, what bow did you start with? Um, I started with 14 pounds on the limbs, uh, uh, but I was four years old, so I probably pulled it back like four like inches. Four pounds or something. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. I also shot at maybe five or ten meters. So, uh, it didn't matter that much what the poundage was. I just wanted to shoot arrows, and uh, it didn't even matter where they landed as long as they landed. So, yeah, mm, uh, right. I think it was 40 pounds to my first bow, and it was uh, 58 inches or something. Mm, okay, there we go. So, thank you for the question. All right, so um, now you've, you've talked about your, your past. Um, what are your future plans? And obviously, uh, Tokyo is your, your main focus this year. So, we think about, like, well, what, what are you planning this year? What are you planning after this? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much just going into the, into the competition season head first. Um, I am preparing now. I'm, uh, I'm working on my technique and on my... Uh, uh, like my uh, general fitness and everything uh, so that I will be fit enough to get through the whole se season without putting too much effort into that. Um, and then, um, yeah, I'm just hoping for the best. Like there's not much I can do differently than I would do normally because I'm trying to be my best every year and the Olympics doesn't really change that. Hmm. And speaking of which, we're going to off track you, but this is relevant anyway. How much time do you dedicate to archery? I think um, <clears throat> purely shooting arrows would be somewhere around 25 hours a week. Um, so it's uh, it's not, not really a hobby anymore. It's uh, It really is a job. And then uh, besides the, the just simply shooting arrows, I, I also do uh, uh, strength training and mental training uh, and just physical training uh, in general. So I think in, in total, everything I do uh, in archery, is 35 hours and then besides those 35 hours uh, i also work in an archery shop so yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> Technically <laughs> speaking, it's most of your life, basically all, all your life to archery, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's a really big deal. Like, I think many of us uh, often get, uh, we don't really see how much work goes into archery, but you see the end result. We see the live streams on uh, a World of Archery. So, oh, yeah, you can shoot a bow. It's really easy. But anyone knows it's not that easy. Yeah? And um, yeah. there's a huge difference between people who, like, dedicate, like, 25 or oh, 35 hours a week versus 35 hours a year uh, in the archery. Yeah. So um, that's something which I found a hard way um, the last week. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll talk more about that next time as well. So, all right. Right, so um, let's see. Now, speaking of which, and this is where we can get, have a bit of a fun discussion. Um, the the thing I want to find out was your mindset in preparing for competition. So, what goes on in your head when you approach competition? And uh, we're thinking about, say, before competition. Let's say, uh, you know, during qualification, and then you know, if you make it to the knockouts, what goes through your head in the final rounds? Um. When I was less uh, capable mentally, uh, it was a, like a very big thing in my head. Um, but that was like, I always wanted to uh, not lose. And uh, I don't think that's the way to go into the final round. But over the years, I've learned that uh, shooting a final round is basically the same as shooting a qualification. You put all the effort you can into this one arrow, and then it hopefully hits the middle, and then you go into the next one. Um, and this seems very simple, but it's uh, it's a very big, uh, big thing. It's it's not very simple at all. Um, and and the way to practice this in my case is to do uh, mental training. Um, I do meditation, um, and when I'm meditating, I try to f focus on this one thing for 15 minutes, give or take. Um, but focusing on one thing for 15 minutes is uh, practically impossible. So. Yeah, you have to deal with the fact that you cannot do something. Uh, and it's the same with archery. If you're uh, trying to shoot the perfect shot and uh, you're not uh, pleased until you shoot a perfect shot, you're not going to be happy after the competition because nobody can shoot a perfect shot. So it's like there's a couple of links you can make between meditation and, uh, and uh, shooting. And uh, for me, mindset links very much to that meditation part. So um, you, you do your best and you... Uh, you put all the effort into the shot you can, but if it doesn't work out, you can get mad about it, or you can just uh, try to do it better next time and uh, yeah, stay positive. Mm. And I, I, I thought that, that is something I noticed when I was shooting at the indoor as well. Um, like we, I, I came from a very different angle from most people. Was to be, obviously the top archers were expecting the best shots all the time. So hit your ten, to hit your nine, you go oh nine, you know, start feeling that that sore part. I'm like, man, I hit the target, yes, you know, I'm I'm still working the positives. But you know, I saw a lot of um very very skilled archers almost destroy themselves like on the line, like they shoot one eight. And the rest of the end, it's still, it's, there's a throwaway out of eight, and then like whatever, six, seven, I don't care anymore. Um, like how, how do you stop that 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 like negative mindset where you know you have a bad shot and you risk collapsing for the rest of the round? Like how do you how do you mitigate that? I think indoors is much more difficult than outdoors in that aspect, especially in uh, like the higher level. If you uh, like, if you want to rank first at an indoor World Cup right now, you have to shoot like five nine. 95 or mm. something in that uh, region so that means that if you shoot at night that's uh, like it's a rare thing um and for shooters uh, of, of my level if you're shooting indoor you're assuming you shoot a 10 and sometimes you don't and uh, there's a, a much different mindset than a, than a shooting outdoor where like half of your arrows are in the 10 and half of them are in the nine when it's wind still mm. so um it's much more difficult to deal with a nine because it has a greater impact uh, essentially on your ranking um and also because you sort of like um a 10 is a normal shot like you you assume that you're going to shoot a 10 so you don't get the high of shooting a 10 because it's like you shoot you, it's more of a relief maybe that you don't shoot a nine so there is there's a vast difference in shooting indoors and outdoors um the the thing you do when you shoot indoors and you shoot a nine is in my opinion, uh, stay calm and uh, try to put the other ones in anyways and not uh, get very mad and then, uh, yeah, that will affect your next shots as well. And uh, on side though, do you prefer uh, indoor or outdoor? I prefer outdoor, which is maybe weird from the world champion indoor. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. 
Um, I've, got a, I've got a quick question here. This seems to be a funny, funny question. Eliza, hello. Uh, so you're a beginner and you're currently using a toy bow. Uh, I'm not sure this is our expertise here, but uh, right, so this toy bow has no arrow rest. If the plastic fletchings touch the riser, will that slow or make the arrow? I'm talking about like a toy bow with the, the plunger arrows. I'm talking about an actual bow here, right? So, I mean, uh, I guess we, we can both answer this, but um, Swift, what, what do you think? How, how do you understand this question? <laughs> We uh, we sell quite quite a few uh, toy bows in our store. Uh, we have a, a nice web shop uh, where people can just buy shit. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I think um, in her case, it won't matter that much if the if the fletchings hit the riser, um, because they will probably correct themselves in flight anyways, and it won't slow the won't slow the arrow down that much unless she's using a whisker biscuit. But I I highly doubt that. Yeah, uh, a toy bow, especially, I'm not sure if it's talking about a toy bow or like a fiberglass youth bow, but yeah, these bows, uh, they don't really matter that much. They're, they're meant to have fun, just pluck the string, make the arrow move forward, and that's the, the bow's purpose done. Uh, I wouldn't really be trying to like, you know, uh, tune a toy bow with like the right fletching, so might be a little overkill there. But um, yeah, uh, and there's a question from a uh, Hollow Sir Reaper. This goes back to your, your training schedule. So what what is your training schedule? Um... I am looking if I can share a screen with you, but no, probably not. We have um, we have uh, training schedules made in the, in an Excel sheet, and it would be very easy to just uh, show it to you. I can show it on my phone and, uh, and talk in the meanwhile. Uh, if you if you can send but, to me, I can I can put on the screen on my side. I hope. Yeah, I'm not sure if uh, if there's like privacy stuff in there, but um. Basically, I start off Monday afternoon. I, I go to work in the morning. And then, um, so yeah, I have it here. And I'll send it or I'll show it here so that nobody gets uh, upset. Okay, that, that um, makes but, sense to me. Yep. Yeah. So the whole week is just filled with blocks of training. Uh, and it's typically Monday afternoon, uh, Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday morning, and a bit of the afternoon. Uh, Thursday morning and afternoon, and then Friday morning and a bit of the afternoon, and then Friday evening is my club evening. And then in the weekend, I, sh I just sort of, um, I freewheel it. So, um, yeah, I, um, I shoot quite a lot, and I do a lot of physical training. Uh, physical training, we have scheduled physical training on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. Um, I try to run on Tuesdays, but I don't always do because I simply don't feel like it or don't have the time to do it. Um, and then uh, we have mental training on Wednesdays and at home. So it's like the whole week is uh, is basically packed with uh, with training. So basically, any any hour that you're not working or like sleeping, you're training. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Mm. And, 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 yeah, so be more specific. So like, uh, what's involved in physical training? You mentioned like a weight training. Like, what else do you do in physical training? Uh, it's um, it's a combination of weight training, uh, core exercises. Um, we do cycling and running, but um, it, it's mostly just weight training. And it's not we're not trying to be uh, bodybuilders or powerlifters, but it's good to train with a bit of weight uh, so your muscles get more tissue. Uh, and, and you get more tissue around the muscles as well. Mm. So uh, uh, we're not supposed to get like huge biceps or whatever, because that'll just be in the way. Mm. But it's good to have some uh, some meat around the muscles to, uh, yeah. Uh, let's say I, I, I fall off my bike and I, uh, I fall on the, on, the, on the ground. It's good if I uh, have a little bit of uh, meat on my body to uh, take the impact. Mm. If I if I were very skinny, it's more likely to get injured by something really stupid. Hmm. All right, that makes so sense. it's yep. injury prevention, but it's also because you can simply get better stability from being stronger. Hmm. Um, and mental training. Mental training, uh, yeah, like I said, in my in my uh, uh, in my case, that's meditation, and I typically do that at home. Uh, but uh, some people in the team do that at the training center uh, before or after the training. Um, and uh, yeah, we just do like uh, training drills, uh, so competitions against each other or uh, like different ways of uh, shooting. There's a lot of differential learning going on. Hmm. 
so it's it's pretty um pretty structured schedule you have so like you, sh- you said your, your time to before lots of colored bars so it's it's pretty intense and i don't know i guess comparing with someone who does it like once a week as a volunteer thing it's a massive massive difference uh yeah. you know, I, guess, I guess you know coming from you know you, you train at a, at a top level um what do you think would be some of the um the big I don't know, game changes. So if someone wanted to push from, say, my kind of casual level to um, a more serious level of shooting, what would be like the steps to take? Like, what would you introduce some? Let's say someone like me shoots once a week or twice a week, if nothing yeah. else. What would be the first step to get someone on a more serious pathway? Um, and look for time to shoot and a place to shoot because those things don't always correlate. Mm. You might have time on Wednesday evenings, but the club might be closed. Um, so, so you'll always need a location um, and a good coach. I think uh, a good coach that you can work with on a uh, like an individual basis. So, not not just the club coach who will just look at you uh, like as a part of the group and say, well, "Today we're going to work on the release or whatever," uh, but somebody who can really look into your uh, faults in the technique and uh, and work on those. I think that's the the two things that can help you uh, yeah, improve in archery. Fantastic. Okay. Um, we've got a question from Ross, and this is the personal question, I guess I don't know. Um, any thoughts about Brady Ellison you'd like to share? <laughs> um, well, I, yeah. There's a, I think there's a, a huge misconception. Uh, people think that I don't like Brady for some reason. Um <laughs> And, and I can guess the reason because uh, he's obviously beat me many times. But uh, <laughs> um, there is no like I don't hold a grudge against him for for beating me. I mean, he's just a phenomenal archer, and uh, it makes sense that he he beats a lot of people. And I just make it far enough into the competition that I get to meet him a lot. Um, but he's a he's a nice guy, and he's just a, he's an amazing archer. So yeah, uh, the chances of uh, losing to him are. Uh, a bit greater than uh, the chances of winning over him, but I think if if I just uh, keep going and uh, if I meet him more often, yeah, maybe the tides will turn. And of course, anything can happen, especially in match play, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, I've got a quick question. We're going to do back to. Uh, I want to skip super honest just for now. Um, Fanus has a question. What about weightlifting? Like, would you recommend, um, you know, someone like a casual shooter, um, get into weightlifting to help them out with the training? Uh, as long as you can do it with somebody who watches you uh, so you don't do anything stupid. <laughs> because we have a, a sports scientist that's uh, with us in every physical training. And that helps so that we don't do any exercises wrong uh, or in a way that would injure us. Mm. Because if you do heavy lifting, you can really uh, injure yourself and uh, yeah, you wouldn't want that to happen. Mm. Uh, yeah, for the rest... Uh, you can uh, just make sure that you start off light and uh, and, and don't go crazy with it. Mm-hmm. And like I said, you don't want to build too much uh, muscle mass because it will just be in the way for archery. So right. you want to get strong but not big. Mm. Okay, it's good to know. Uh, now, Super Honest had a good question too. So um, he only has 20 meters to, uh, to shoot from. What's the best way to prepare for longer distance with only a uh, small space? Um. I would say smaller target and see if you can hang the target a bit higher because the the angle in your hips and shoulders will also um, play its part when you're uh, going to a longer distance. At least in my experience, it's uh, it's definitely something you need to account for because sometimes if I if I do an uh, uh, like an intense indoor season and I go back to 70 meters. Even since, like, I'm a professional archer, and even I have to look, get used to the, the difference in angle again. So it makes sense to me that you would hang the target uh, higher, as if you were shooting a longer distance, mm. and uh, make it smaller so that you get used to aiming outside of the yellow, probably. Mm. Great. Uh, got a question from Roy. I think it's something we can both answer. It's a finger sling question. I'm trying to interpret the English here, but I think I know, I know what you're saying. So. Roy has improved to the point where um, he needs a finger sling to keep the bow from flying, so using a finger sling, which is good. Um, and you're looking for one which is quick to put on and take off, I imagine. Um, I know for a fact that there are commercial 
finger slings, which is basically a plastic um, tube you just slide on and off. But uh, on that note, like, are, are there any secrets with your finger slings? Or are you just like tie a knot or something? Like any any recommendations? <laughs> would, would this be a good moment to plug my own YouTube channel? Because uh, I recently made a video about that. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I should do that. Uh, <laughs> so I'll look that up. Making your own finger sling. Trust me, this this is what we do on the streams all the time. I say, oh, I have a question. Watch my video on this one. I made one already. <laughs> all I right. was, I was to copy a link from the one computer and paste it into the one or the other one, but that obviously doesn't work. So let's do it again. All right, I'll, I'll look it up as well while we're talking about that. But yeah, definitely that. check out uh, Triple Trouble Archery on YouTube. Uh, most of the answers for your best tuning questions we found right there. <laughs> And Roy's happy as well. And Yap's already on it. <laughs> of course, Yap. <laughs> All right, beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I might bring it up a bit later, but um, while, while we're doing that, uh, let's go to our, our next question. Um, oh, hell, Glass has a point here. Um, I recently purchased Swift's Recurve Sight Pin. Amazing, by the way. I was wondering what lens type you prefer to shoot with. Medium, square, large, aperture, etc. I um, don't use any apertures in mine. Uh, we just uh, put them in the set. So, uh, or it, it sounds weird if I say I don't use any apertures, but um, yeah, I think I have them. I've been getting. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, my side pin, of which I have one here. If you don't know it, it's this one. Um, and I just shoot it the way it comes out of the box. So there's like, uh, you've got the fiber, uh, but there's nothing in there. Like you can put rings in it that also come with it. Uh, and that's different kinds. So, uh, you got a square one and you got like smaller rings to look through and, but I like to have it completely open and, uh, and round. And I switch a bit between the 0 0.019 and the 0 0.029. Because yeah, sometimes I feel like a larger pin, and sometimes I feel like a smaller pin. Mm. Uh, I do always shoot with a green one because I like the the yeah, I like how it looks better on the target than a red one. But mm. yeah, since there's a lot of people that like to shoot with a red one, it's uh, nice to offer those as well. Hmm, interesting. All right, so um, all right, so let's move to our next uh, question. So um. Uh, this is something which is more from me because so I've never done this before actually. So this is about team competitions, all right? So obviously you're, you're, you're a big part of the uh, the Dutch team. Um, how does a team competition work and how is it different to an individual competition? Um, a team competition, you shoot, um, you only shoot knockouts. Like there is no team qualification. And the qualification is just an added up uh, sum of the three scores that you've already shot with the individual qualification. And then you um, you shoot two arrows per person per end, which makes six arrows an end because there's three people in the team. Mm. And then it's a set system, and it's a best of five from the top of my head. So the first to five set points wins. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, you you try to shoot as many points in the, in an end uh, with six arrows, and you hope you have more points than the other team. The difference between um, team and individual uh, as for mental aspects is in my opinion that in the individual you can only blame yourself because you make choices uh, for yourself and by yourself and in the team competition you're constantly trying to um, like make up for your teammates or hope that your teammates will make up for your mistakes so it's a much different thing to do mentally. Mm. And what, what, is, is that something you like? Do you prefer a team event or do you prefer individual events? I prefer individual because, like, I started archery because it's an individual sport, or I, I like, I started archery at a higher level because I liked the uh, individuality. Is that a word? Yep. <laughs> um, mm. a bit, yeah, it it makes sense to me. Like, it's a very nice uh, thing to just be responsible for your own result. Um, and obviously team is also fun to do, but it's, it's fun to do on the side for me. Mm. I uh, definitely prefer the individual. Even yeah. though I, in my opinion, the, the sport of archery has evolved into a team sport now that we have mixed team and team at the Olympics and only one individual event. 
Um, and, and obviously, each but in a team, it's much different. Like, like you said before, you've got like different people rather than one person to blame. Um, so, like in terms of the the team structure, like do you, do you find yourself preferring to shoot like in like first or second or third? Um, I'm always the anchor, mm. so I always shoot uh, the last. Um, I think if I say it correctly. I forgot our team order. I just know that I'm last. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Steve is first. So yeah. My uh, my uh, little helper is telling me that Steve is uh, the first shooter. <laughs> right. So uh, Steve, uh, Rick is uh, the middle, and uh, and I anchor. Is there a reason for that, or just like the way it is? Um, I am quite good at shooting ridiculous shots and still hitting uh, pretty good. So if we have uh, any time struggles or uh, time pressure, I can just uh, get on the line, pull back my bow, and release it, and it'll probably still fall <laughs> into the goal. Yeah, I remember watching a few of your team plays uh, on the World Cups, and then I, I think I fanboyed a few a uh, few times um, for you when you shot your your final shot. So uh, yeah, definitely a very good anchor. Speaking of funny shots, uh, this is one of the, the viewer questions, which we'll skip to, and um, talk about the way you shoot. So. Um, I think this is from Alex. This is our second question on our list here, and, and this might tie into what you mentioned before. So, there are there are some shots where you you tend to swing outwards rather than then the bow drop. Is there any reason or advantage to doing this? Uh, yes, <laughs> yes to both. Uh, I think there is an advantage to having a skill to correct your shot because that's basically what's happening. Mm. Um, and I've tried to explain this before. I have my uh, trusty side pin out as a as a you know a helper for my uh, for my story so when i'm aiming um it's aiming is a movement which is something that some people don't realize but aiming is always like moving right? so let's say i'm moving in in like uh, a figure eights and then um you want the arrow to go off here in the middle but if it's going off here i need to correct but it would be senseless in my in my head to when the shot goes off to correct it just that much and then stop your bow again because there's a lot of inertia and quite a heavy bow so i would i would have to like put that energy in motion and then stop it again so that's a lot of a lot of wasted energy in my opinion so i typically just correct it and then i let the go bow or the bow go where it wants to go um so that's basically why my arm goes all places when i'm shooting um and I think it's not something you can learn or you can teach, uh, and it's it's something that just uh, like you grow into doing or uh, that you have from the get go. And um, I've been doing this since I was small, and I've never really uh, seen a reason to uh, not do it anymore. Hmm. I think it's important to reinforce, and we can both agree on this too. That especially with using a sight, you, you meant to you meant to let the sight float. It's not something you hold as still as possible. It does move around. Um, and I think what what um, what Swift is saying is that you, you have to adapt and respond to what your bow is doing. So if you feel you need to move or you need to uh, correct the sight before you release, then that's something you have to do. It's why you know not every shot will have the picture perfect swinging follow through, which people love to see. Um, it is a more dynamic process. Hmm. Um, the, the other thing I want to point out is that you, it, it depends on who does this too. Like some people can do it really well and they can correct their shot and it'll hit the eight or the nine still pretty easily. But uh, if I you see, really, yeah, Australia, yeah. I think uh, Brian Tyak has uh, has probably paved the road for uh, correcting shots. <laughs> I think it has quite a bit of his trademark now. But uh, yeah, if if you uh, if you see someone do it and they swear, then it's a bad shot. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like the the, the, the mark might pick it up, but uh, if you see them swearing, then they're, they're, they're screwed it up. So there's the people who do it like purposefully, and there are people who accidentally do it. <laughs> All right, uh, Jeff has a quick question. We can both answer this one. Um, do you use some kind of magnifying glass on your sight? The answer is no. We can't do it on recurve. Uh, it's uh, it's yeah. yeah. You can't. You can use a plain piece of like glass or plastic, but you can't have any magnification on your sight. Uh, compound can. Recurve can't. In fact, when you go to good competition, um, the judge will do an equipment check and they'll actually see if there's any magnification um, through your through your site. Um, 
But uh, yeah, Jeff, you mentioned this because you said that you can't see the target very well on a 7 meter range. That's actually a good point. I guess Swift, while you're here, um, so what advice do you have to someone who is um, trying to sight at 70 meters? Because it is a small target, no, no kidding there. Um, so what, what advice or what tips would you have for someone who's shooting long distance? Sorry, I was uh, I was watching the live chat and I completely didn't hear. <laughs> yeah. it. So the, the question was from from live chat. So what advice would you have from someone uh, for someone who is trying to sight at seventy meters and is having a hard time? Um, well, I think um, you don't need to see the target completely sharp, um, as um, I think Im Dong Hyun has uh, has proved in the past, and also Steve uh, in our team he sees about fifteen percent with his eyes. I think. Um, so he's, uh, he's practically blind, uh, and <laughs> he, uh, but he doesn't use glasses because like, he doesn't like to see the target completely sharp. Um, he likes to aim at a blur because it makes him like his whole aiming more relaxed and he can just shoot a shot right at it and, mm. and stick with the, the aiming because it, aiming is not something that people take lightly. It's, uh, it's something that, um, a lot of people freak out about and uh, they want to like completely have it in the middle and then they stop working like when you're shooting you want to keep moving and you want to uh, keep extending but if you're aiming too much you will cramp up and mm. stop moving so yeah I, it can be an advantage to see uh, to see it a little blurry but uh yeah mm. i think uh, yeah you don't need to necessarily uh, see if you're uh, if you're aiming in the 10 or 9 or maybe even 8 it won't make that much of a difference because you'll correct it automatically anyways. Hmm. All right, now a question from David Novak. Uh, this is uh, interesting. We're not sure if we know much about this, but um, uh, David works with uh, disabled um, athletes. So um, his question is that in competitions, are there any regulations um, on, I guess, special equipment? So this is talking about, say, arm amputees who are using like a mouth release. Do you know of any, um, like, any regulations which... Uh, what well, would prevent someone using a modified release or a piece of equipment to compensate for a disability? Um, there's definitely, like, there's a whole uh, Paralympic archery scene. Um, and I think there's different classes, and I'm not completely up to date with all of them. Um, but you can either shoot with your mouth without a release uh, and then just shoot a recurve, or you can shoot with a release, uh, and then you can shoot compound, I think. But I'm I'm not sure. There's like, uh, there's a lot of um, different ways of doing it, uh, and I will see if I can find the rule book. Yeah, uh, well, uh, it's on World Archery too. There is a whole section on um on different categories of uh of uh, para uh, para archery. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the the big one is that I think for a rear curve you can't have an assisted release or release aid, but with a compound you can. And that can be mouth release or. A uh, 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 shoulder release or brace or foot release. You can use release aids with compound, but I think with reek it has to be with fingers, as, as far as I know. Yeah. It uh, sounds logical. Yeah. I, I, I hope that helps. Um, but definitely check it out on the World Archery website yeah. for the official rules and any national organization you're working with. Um, and there's sometimes, especially for national organizations, some of these can be a little overlooked because um, some countries uh, don't have developed para-archery scenes. Um, that's something we're trying to grow as well. Um, also, I'll give a shout out to one of my um, viewers and someone I met in Sydney uh, the other week. Um, uh, she, 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 she was sharing a, a very sad story about how she entered the, um, the indoor series as well as the only um, female para-archer. And... You know, she wanted to go through the whole thing, do qualifications, do match play, but she was the only one who turned up. So, uh, you know, she, she wasn't allowed to compete in match play at all. Um, she wanted to go against the Open tournament, but she, she, did, she did the qualification, got her medal, and it's been her story for most of the competitions, being the only one who competes um, in these events. So um, definitely we try to grow more people doing para archery um, and encourage more people to give archery a shot. It's just so important to for everybody to have a go, but uh, it really, it's really sad for her to um, hear that. But she had a good time. But something to keep in mind is to definitely encourage people. You know, if you know someone who, um, who might have a disability, archery. <laughs> you know, archery is a great sport to get into. No matter, no, no matter who you are and what you can do, archery is something everyone can do. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, Super Honest has another question. Uh, should I glue in my pin knocks? 
that depends on if you mean gluing in your pins because with most arrows i would say yes but i think carbon express has pins that you can just push in and take out mm. uh, but i wouldn't glue your knocks onto your pins Obviously. because they are meant uh, <laughs> yeah it, it's obvious for us but uh, I, if that's the yeah. question uh, you shouldn't glue your knocks onto your pins Mm. Um, I think to be fair too, you're right. Like in some some shafts, the pin fits in perfectly. Uh, in fact, yeah. like, I've had a couple of my pins, um, the glue's dried off, and I still shoot them. I, I forget to glue them back in. They shoot fine, by the way, but uh, you might yeah. find they'll come off a bit too easily, especially on the string. So the pin itself, you're meant to glue, but the knock, you don't. You just, you know, yeah. pipe it on as usual. Um, I think there's an interesting mm. question about having double sights. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, but uh, Gilarian asks, since I'm an inventive kind, I was wondering if it will be any good to make something similar to rifle sights for a bow. Like instead of one alignment point, to have two some or 20 centimeters apart. I believe we call them like one. peep sights, aren't they? Are they compound yeah. peep sights? Yeah. Uh, it's allowed in compound shooting, so they have it. They have a, a little circle in their string and a, a side on the bow, and they have to align those two. Uh, with a recurve, you're not allowed to have more than one uh, aiming device. So you can only have one point uh, with you with which you aim. So um, it's a good idea, and uh, it's definitely been tried before, but that's why they made a rule against it, because it's just too much of an advantage. Yeah, it kind of defeats the purpose of recurve. Um, I mean, sights arguably kind of does uh, away from that. But compound is meant to be precision, so you have the most precise tools for compound. Recurve is yeah. a bit more natural, so you know it doesn't give that much of an advantage if uh, if 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 nobody has one basically. Um, and, and, and there are actually stricter rules of bare bow. I'm not sure if you saw a lot of bare bow rules, but um, there are rules on what color the string can be. There are rules on how big the serving can be, because if you can use the yeah. serving as an aiming tool, then that's disqualified as well. Um, to be actually, fair, yeah. that's, also, that's also a rule in uh, recurve shooting. You cannot have the serving up to your eye because you mm. could use it as a deep sight, but that's, uh, yeah. it doesn't get checked very regularly. Like it gets checked with uh, equipment inspections. Mm. But I think it's something that's easily overlooked. And just just to clarify, uh, I know you've got like stuff lying around. I have strings lying around, of course. So um, just to clarify, what we're talking about. So let's say I've got this this black string over here. Um, actually, my, my my unfortunately my screen the thing is tiny, but you can just see in my tiny screen over here that there are I've got a black string with yellow serving. The point is that with the middle serving. If it's too, and I apologize for my fans, I mean, uh, Swift can see it's completely fine, but everybody else can see this tiny box on the screen. Point being is that I've got a, a center serving over here, right? So that's the center serving over here. Um, there is a maximum length you can have to center serving. If it gets too high up, I can use it as basically a rear sight. Right, and that's what uh, is disallowed. Um, Bebo definitely does it. Recap does it too, but it's really checked. There's no one that actually does this. Uh, but th there was one time there's a person in my club um, who specifically requested me to make a new string for him because while he was competing in the nationals, um, the judge called him out for having a serving just slightly too um, too long. And what he had to do was he had to get a black marker and just basically cull the whole thing in. So therefore, it can yeah. be used as a uh, as a sighting tool. So he wasn't doing that way, but because the regulation is it can only be you know that big, um, he needs a new string or needs to remove the serving next time. Um, quick question from Farnas as well. So um, V bars, adjustable V bars uh, or static ones, which are better? Um, the one that suits you best, I think. If you have a set. Um angle that you want your stabilizers at uh, up and down and also to the to the sides that's yeah why not use a use a normal static v-bar mm. um but i i for one have my uh right stabilizer out a little more than my left one and it's uh, very difficult to find a static v-bar that has asymmetrical shape so uh yeah so i use a uh, an adjustable one pretty much for that reason Mm. Uh, I prefer adjustable just because you can adjust it. <laughs> I mean, especially if you're not sure exactly what your preferences are, you can buy like five static ones. You can buy one adjustable one. Um, even yeah. if you, even if you never adjust it, then at least you can keep it the way it is. Um, just find out what works for you. Um, and there yeah. are adjustable V bars now that are just as solid as the uh, the static ones. Maybe even more solid. Like um, 
I'm I'm not uh, sponsored by any stabilizer pens at the moment, so um, I'm using the Shrewd Atlas uh, V bar, um, and I think the the Trueball XL V bar are like those two V bars. I don't think you can you can move them at all if you're locking them in. I think they're just as strong as a as a good static static V bar. So yeah, mm. uh, My, uh, yeah. Uh, I did like the app, so you you jabbed it. Like, having a a feed around with wooden bows and wooden arrows. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um. Actually, funny thing is, I've I've been trying to propose to my club that we should have a special club competition. We only use club bows, right? So only the junior bows, only the uh the fiber club, whatever, whatever the arrows we have. I've actually been cheating. I've I've strung every bow. I've used every bow right and left handed. So I've got an advantage there. So I've been secretly yeah. training for this one. I'm trying to push this club event. Just to win this, because I don't win anything else. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I shoot better with my like 14 pound kids bow than I do with my actual recurve bow. So um, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of my embarrassment. I, I probably should have brought that along to um to the indoor instead. Um, yeah, why not? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I should I should bear bow kids better than recurve. Um, David Novak has another question again. Um, this is a very common question actually. It's the Oneida bows or Oneida bows. Are they allowed in competition? Um, I think they would be considered a compound because they have uh, more strings and cables, and hmm. like it's a in the book, it's a compound. Yeah, it's it's the it's a textbook compound case. Um, this because has recurve limbs doesn't mean it's not a not, it doesn't mean it's a recurve. Uh, it's actually a compound bow by function, design, and definition. So it, if you could use it, it would be a compound, except it kind of lacks the advantages of a compound. That's my understanding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, mm. To get back to the, the challenge that Yap posed me, um, we did a um, a challenge that is going to be uploaded in two days, <laughs> um, where Yap shoots with a two thousand euro bow and I shoot with a two hundred euro bow, uh, and I think uh, I don't want to spoil too much, but uh, Yap is looking for different challenges to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we definitely gotta check that one out. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. Um, and our glass is a question at the moment too. So, a recommended distance for bear shaft tuning. Um, I always stick to thirty meters mm. because I feel uh, some people say I shoot my bear shaft at seventy meters because that's the distance I'm going to shoot my competitions at. But if you look closely to your bear shaft, if it flies, it can be like it can go to the left first and then and then turn to the right. So it can have like a double uh, uh, whip or whatever you want to call it. Uh, whereas on 30 meters, it's long enough that you can definitely see a difference in uh, flex shafts and bear shafts. Um, but it won't have that double, like double, um, you know, the, the, the flight. Yeah, yeah. So I think 30 meters is a very good distance to do your bear shaft tuning. Yeah, uh, I agree with that too. I think I think many coaches will agree. I think anything above thirty meters, you kind of read your market tuning. It's kind of excessive, um, but yeah, thirty meters is probably the optimal. Plus, you don't lose your bear shaft as much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you need that badly. Um, let's see. We got some other viewer questions here now. Uh, we got a couple of draw weight ones. So we'll go back to our list here. We go to um Ira, who is a fellow Dutchman. Um, is it worth going up to forty pound for indoor archery? Um, I think 40 pounds is like the breaking point. If you go over 40 pounds in indoor, uh, I don't think you get any more advantage from it, except for the fact that you can shoot bigger arrows uh, more precisely. True. Um, then again, Easton has those RX-7 arrows now. Uh, I haven't tested them uh, excessively yet because I'm not doing indoor this year, but uh, you can get away with lower poundage and still get a big shaft. So if you want to shoot a big shaft indoors, you can. Um, but I don't think, like, I, I had an injury uh, some some time ago, and I shot a lighter bow, uh, and, like, on 18 meters, I could barely notice a difference in my groupings. So uh, on 70, I could, but on 18, I couldn't. So I think for indoor, it doesn't make sense uh, if you're purely shooting indoor to go very mm, Yeah, good. Uh, and we've got a second question. It's from Lukman, which is just above our question. So what exercises do you recommend for increasing bow weight? Or draw weight rather. Um, basically, just shoot more. <laughs> it's, it's not, yeah, it's not really that stupid and uh, and simple. But 
you can do a lot of exercises in the gym, but they won't necessarily translate to shooting. Um, the, the exercises that we do in the gym are mainly uh, to prevent injury from shooting. So that's something you do if you want to go up and down to uh, still go to the gym and train your like your shoulders and arms. Um, like not, not go super heavy, but just make sure that you have some, um, some muscle tissue. Um, and then, yeah, uh, you can also start off the training with blank bill with uh, like a slightly heavier bow than you were going to shoot the rest of the training. Uh, that also helps, but for the rest, I cannot really yeah, think of something except for just shoot and uh, yeah. Uh, well, one okay. thing, one thing I do, I'm not sure if it helps or not, is I do my um, SBTs or specific physical training using a heavier bow or heavier limbs. So I've got like a 50 pound bow here, which I draw like 48 or something in my draw length. But I've used that for training, but don't shoot that. Um, so that kind of one, it helps condition for a heavy bow gradually. But two, it also makes my lighter bow easy to shoot because oh, it's, it's only like 40 pound. That's easy. Um, so yeah, you, yeah you, can, you can train with a heavier bow. Um, you might shoot one as a warm or like, like Swift said with a blind bow. Um, yeah. but yeah, like you, you, you can't really train up to a heavy bow. You just know you can do it once you start shooting it. So it's something you acquire over time. And then, uh, uh yeah. to get into shooting a higher range and increasing bow weight, uh, don't forget your tab as well. Like if you're gonna, uh, in increase your, uh, your draw weight, uh, it's smart to also look at the amount of leather you use. And so you don't mess up your fingers. Mm. You don't want to have uh, nerve damage on your fingers. Mm, good. All right, so I've got a quick question from uh, Ihain. Uh, is there a rule about two-stage clickers? Uh, yes, you can only have one draw length indicator. Ah. Uh, so if it's one clicker that has like a bend in it, so it goes inwards and then clicks, that's fine. But you can only have one indicating uh, uh, device for your draw length. So you cannot have uh, a clicker where you're almost there and then another clicker when you're there mm. because that's legal according to the rule book. Okay. There you go. That's a straightforward answer there. Thank you. All right. Uh, what other interesting questions do we have here? Um, Aegis Claw has a couple of questions. Um, one is really good. I actually want to take the top question of it here. So we're talking about arrows and bows here, right? So what's more important? You're shooting a top quality arrow or are you shooting a top quality bow? Um, I think you would get further with... Uh, how, do, how do I explain this? If you're having uh, or if you're shooting with intermediate equipment, I think it would be better to invest in uh, top quality arrows than to invest into a top quality bow. Mm. Uh, but if you have beginner equipment and you purely want to know, like, uh, should I, like, or what would happen if I get a very expensive bow and shoot very cheap arrows with it, or the other way around, I would say, uh, a beginner bow with top arrows will shoot better than a very good bow with beginner arrows. So yeah, it uh, it depends on the, on what your starting point is. Yeah, I agree with that too. Arrows make the biggest difference. It's probably the most uh, the most underrated thing. You always people always buy arrows first and like, well, well, no, wait, wait a bit first, and then pick the good arrows once you're uh, once you're settled. Um, but the arrow, in terms of like, I think, I think, I think if you're thinking of the impact on your score, like here and now, I think your arrows make the biggest difference. If you go from cheap arrows to very good arrows, you'll see a score difference right away. Whereas if you talk about a growth perspective, like it, which one will you become better with? Perhaps the, uh, the bow is a better investment. So you can get cheap arrows, but you get a very good bow and you grow into, you, you grow into your form and skill and consistency much sooner with a good bow rather than with good arrows. Good arrows won't make a bad archer good. I think that's a uh, good mantra. Like a good, good arrows will make a good archer better, but won't make a bad archer yep. good. And now this is a great moment for me to get into one of my pet peeves. Mm. Um, if you're shooting short draw length and under 40 pounds, don't buy extends. Like it doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, you are much better off with an ACE arrow because they're lighter and at your draw length and poundage, they will be skinny as well. So you won't get affected by the wind too much, uh, but you will still get the speed uh, that you need to get uh, a proper score. If, you, if you're going to get extends with uh, that light draw weight and, uh, and a short draw length, I think you're going to waste your money. 
Yeah, huge. Uh, I'll, I'll share that from experience. So people say, why'd you get the ACEs? Why'd you get the X10s? I don't need X10s. Yeah. <laughs> ACEs work fine. <laughs> yeah. They look better ACEs in some cases right. too. The most underrated arrows in the lineup of uh, of Eastern, I think. Because people, they, uh, they get... Um, uh, what is it the accs or acgs and and then they're like okay i have an intermediate arrow like i, I mm. I'm, I'm getting somewhere but it's not quite there yet and then they get to a point where they think maybe i should get into professional arrows and then they suddenly get extends but i think the ace for many people is a much better arrow than the extend only when you get to a very heavy or long draw length uh, you can get a lot of points out of the extend rather than shooting an ace um but I think for um, over fifty uh, percent of people, the ACE will, will work just as fine. Yeah, I agree with that too. My coach always pushed ACE only because ACE was the best at the time. But I always push ACEs on me. Um, I'll, I'll say this from experience: X ten did nothing for me. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> like we said, a yeah. great a great arrow doesn't make a great archer. So uh, I end up yeah. I still have like eight left, but man, that was like sweating bullets because every time you shot, it, did I break the arrow? <gasps> you know. And uh, by the way, don't practice with X tens. That's just dumb. Okay, practice with whatever arrow you want, but don't practice with X tens. <laughs> In like if you're yeah. doing like blind belt, don't shoot the X tens. Even a smash shaft, smash like carbon ones or something. Don't smash X tens. Unless yeah, you're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm sponsored, and I still uh, don't use my same arrows for bear shaft or for a uh, for blank build, and uh, so I have like uh, old sets from years ago that I use for my uh, my blank build sessions because I don't want to wreck my arrows. Mm. So something which just people don't really realize is like you 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 have different sets for different purposes. You don't use your X tens for competi- for practice when there's competition. So you know you gotta be smart about this, especially if you've got a limited budget. Don't smash X tens at ten meters. That's that's dumb. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, uh, we have a rule, uh, or I'm not sure it's enforced anymore. But when I uh, moved to Papenal, the Olympic Training Center that I train at. Um, our coach said that if you break a knock or an arrow on five meters while shooting blank bill, you needed to run a round of one kilometer as a, as, as punishment because it's just stupid. Like it, there's no reason to break arrows on blank bill. You can just, if you're if you're as good as we were at that moment, you can aim them apart uh, without any problems and uh, and you don't need to break anything. So uh, yeah, it was just like because it's so unnecessary to break arrows on blank bill, uh, he made us uh, run a lap every time we did so. <laughs> all right. And by the way, uh, good luck to Yap uh, for your shoot. So uh, shoot some 10s. Hope you shoot all 10s. And uh, hope to see you later as well. Um, uh, Killian, we have the question right now. Uh, the core pulse, does, does that count as a beginner or intermediate bow? I know that we have that in stock. I uh, need to look it up so I have uh, an image of it in my head. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the beginner entry level sort of stuff we're talking about. Yeah, let me also pull yeah. it up. Yeah, I think the core pulse is. Yeah, that's definitely a beginner bow in my book. Um, and that is also very similar to the bow I've used in the challenge that we're going to upload in two days. Mm. <laughs> nice. Uh, I'm Googling, I see myself. Damn it, new sense. Stop covering these bows. All right, this one. Yeah, that's a, that's a um, beginner bow, typical one. Yeah, um, yeah it's the. Yeah, most of them are the same. Like, yeah, they're, they're good budget bows. Um, you know, most of them handle the same, but they're they're not um, they're not intermediate or advanced bows. They're very much stuff that you get for your first bow. I'm gonna take a bite. Okay, all right. So we've got a few more questions. We'll we'll clean through the rest of prepared questions. We'll go through a few final uh, live questions. Um, this is from Ages Claw as well, and the question is: How old is too old to reach the highest levels of archery? Sorry, I'm eating breakfast at the same time. Um, to reach the highest level of archery, if you're like well into your 20s or beginning 30s, I think you should maybe reconsider. Um, but I might be a bit harsh here. Um, to uh, stay in the highest level of archery, you can go a long way. Um, We've seen it recently with uh, the Rome Archery Trophy, where Marco Galeazzo beat uh, Brady Edison. Um, Marco has been around for ages. Like he won the Olympics in 2004, which is 16 years ago this year. So uh, 
yeah, he, I think he's in the end of his uh, 30s and yeah, he still does really well. So if you're at a high level and you want to keep shooting at a high level, you can go on for a very long time. But if you're wanting to reach it, I would say yeah, you have to be quite young to, uh, to get somewhere. I think part of it too, like it's not just, I mean, archery is a sport which most people can do um, for a long, long time. And it, once, I, I agree with you, by the way, if once you reach a high level, you can definitely stay there. I mean, even if not like international, even at just, nas- just national level, it's still a high level. Um, you know, you see people in their 40s and 50s out shoot the kids just because they've been doing it for so long, they can still pull the bow back, they've got the draw where to shoot 70 meters. They'll they'll, yeah. they'll they'll wipe the floor with anybody who's coming through. We see like coaches, they've been coaching for like thirty years, still wipe the floor with their own like you know like Olympic athletes just because you know it's a sport which rewards experience and composure rather than physical fitness. I think yeah. the point is that young people tend to have a lot more time to invest in their training early on. They can get into a peak much early on and. And that that's what I think is a hard part of coming from an older perspective, is that you don't have you don't have the time. You can't invest the same time because you're working, you got family. You, it's less flexible to work around, and especially if you're not conditioned with the mental and physical training to like, accelerate to Olympics. You can't go from like starting out to Olympics within two years in your thirties or forties. It's something which. It's okay, I think I think we're being harsh, but it's not realistic for most people. But we don't discourage yeah. you from trying. Like you can definitely reach yeah. a high level, even if it means like not competing at the Olympics. Because you can definitely still be up there in the game. Um, but yeah, that's a very good question too. Is the age part? Uh, don't let age be a gate for you, because you know it all depends on how much time you're willing to put into it. Like I yeah. said, I think the main reason why we see mostly young athletes is for most reasons is that you've got the time, the flexibility, the a bit of freedom, I guess, you know, um, whereas an older person is just bound down by more things. Uh, you know, for, for me, I have to like, you know, if I go to uh, Vegas or, Lan- or Lancaster, I have to decide to take time off work, for example. And, you know, that means, you know, that that's a harder thing for me to kind of drive my bus, of my archery bus around with my life commitments. Um, yeah. But yeah. Nicely to uh, the question of super honest. Mm. He says, "Do Olympians pay for their own travel?" Um, and I mostly don't, but indoor I would, uh, even though I don't do indoor this year. Um, typically, indoor competitions I have to uh, pay for myself. Uh, World Cups are covered by our national Olympic committee, so um, they uh, they have a budget uh, of which we can use a certain amount um but it's not like that for every country so i know there's uh there are lots of countries where you have to pay for yourself for your own trips uh and then in other countries it's depending on your uh, level so i know that in australia there's a handful of people that get funded to go places uh, but there's also others who have to pay themselves so yeah mm-hmm. it's uh, it's different for every country but i typically don't pay for my own competitions I think when you mentioned indoor, is because indoor is an uh, individual open entry, therefore you don't represent a team. Is that, is that the the case? Unless you're in a Korean uh, uh, factory team. Mm, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, for those who don't realize, like um, the, the indoor World Series, and I think the indoor championship was the same back then, Like you don't represent the country. So you and you represent yourself. You're from a country, obviously, but you don't you don't represent like the Australian team or the the Dutch team. So you represent yourself. That's why you see in the indoor tournaments the more more sponsor shirts, more t-shirts, or more like casual wear because that's not you're not representing a, the Korean national team. So um, you know what you see in in Nimes right now is going to be the same in most indoor competitions because you're not doing a national tournament. Um, you're just representing yourself. So that's why you pay for yourself. If you want to go, you go. You don't have to be chosen. You just enter. It's open entry. Um, for example, I could enter Nimes. I could enter Vegas. Um, not that I don't plan to, but I can. Um, anyone can enter. You can enter. I can enter. That's You, you, you pay your way. That's basically how it works. All right. Um, we'll wrap up a few more questions. Uh, I want to touch Jake Kaminsky. I'm not sure why it's trolling me or you, but um, it says, are you going to bring back the Cyborg Eye for Tokyo? Um, well, I had the, the, the blood run eye in, uh, in Rio. <laughs> that, was, that was due to a cluster headache and the, 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 the fact that I had to throw up uh, because of the pain. So I hope I don't, but I can also not guarantee it won't happen. <laughs> 
by the way jake Kaminsky, i love you by the way <laughs> thank you for that <laughs> All right. By the way, when Jake does his live stream, I'll get Swift to ask him a question too. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. A fun question from Reddit, by the way. So, um, so you've been building some classic recurves. You, the question is, how should pro middlers come along, and are you planning on building any other classic recurves? Um, my pro medalist I still have lying around. Um, and I have shot that one competition with it, and then I've kept it as a set, but I haven't shot with it anymore because I just simply haven't had the time. Um, and I do have some other stuff lying around. Uh, somebody is asking if I have a Yamaha, and I have a lovely Yamaha Aeola that I uh, might shoot a competition with. So, yeah, I, I do have, I have some stuff in the books, but... Um, uh, to be honest, um, like between uh, me and the and the live stream, it's also um, we're also looking for things on on videos that do well on YouTube. We're not just making the videos that we like to make, but it's a it's a mix of videos that we like and a mix of videos that you guys like. Um, and the pro medalist videos haven't really like taken off, um, so I could do more of those. But the question is, are people going to watch it or? Mm. Uh, so yeah, I, I do this stuff uh, as a hobby, and then um, it's it's nice if people watch it. But yeah, I might uh, I might get into making videos of more old bows, and um, but then I'm also struggling with some sponsor contracts. For instance, I uh, um, I'm sure they they won't mind too much, but um, if I'm constantly showing other brands on my YouTube channel, I'm I'm sure they all stretch behind their ears. Mm. That's yeah. true. All right. Um, let's see, um, and I guess, uh, we'll, we'll start wrapping up. Aside from archery, what do you do in your spare time? Um, I make videos about archery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds familiar. <laughs> and, uh, and also I, I like to go for walks and, uh, and I do some photography, but, uh, I don't have many hobbies outside of archery. I mainly have hobbies within archery. <laughs> That, that seems to make a lot of sense to me somehow. <laughs> All right. So uh, we'll, we'll give everyone a chance to ask any final questions for a wrap up. Uh, it's been like an hour plus now, so we're doing pretty well. So chat, any last questions for Swift before we head off? And we'll take a few last questions at the end. Um, just while we we're waiting for that, there's a question from Lee Walker, which is good over here. So uh, this is a bit above. Uh, I'm a right-hand archer, but arrows landing left. Sight pin is way over, so obviously it's something I'm doing. I've got a long draw, string picture picture release, good. Any advice, please? Mm. So I think basically right hand shooter, arrows landing left. What's he doing? Um, well, there's a multitude of things that can be happening, but uh, it can be that your arrows are simply a lot of, uh, like, uh, a lot too stiff. Uh, then they will go to the left. Um, it might be that uh, you have some clearance problems and that the back of the arrow is touching and then uh, it heads off to the left. Um, or it could be as simple as reduce some tension in your plunger or uh, or see if you can play with your center shot. But it's very difficult to, to fix this stuff from a distance because there is like, uh, it's much easier if you can see it and if you can feel the plunger and if you can look over the bow and but that's not something that's easily done over uh, over distance. So. Yeah, definitely great. If, if you show your coach or show somebody else who knows what they're doing, they'll probably fix it within like two minutes. But you try and ask us, we'll spend like 20 minutes trying to diagnose every single problem. So uh, this is like tech support. We can't really help you at the moment. So make sure you turn it off and turn it on again. No, that should fix the problem. Um, something you should really think about though is um, whether it's um, either, is it, is it all your arrows or is it some arrows? That will indicate whether it's you or the bow as well. Um, yeah. Oh, Lookman has a question. So Lookman asked a question before, so he's back in chat now. Um, is it possible to have your bow arm too in line? Uh, because I'm, even though I have rotated my arm and my shoulder is low, I still get string clearance for my bow arm. To read this for myself, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I hit my arm every single shot I shoot. So um, obviously there's a difference in overstretching your arm and, uh, and then you can turn it away, but then it's still like it bends inwards. 
Um, so for me, I have my arm straight, but not over straight. Uh, but yeah, uh, the bruising is almost uh, gone, but I have a bruise here from from last Friday. <coughs> so um, yeah, I hit my arm still after 20 years of shooting. <clears throat> and, and it still shoots fine, so don't stress too much about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, as being serious though, like, you know, we, we've been told that, look, as long as your arrow's on target, it doesn't matter if you tap your arm guard or, like, smack your arm. As long as the shot's good, it's good. So, um, yeah, it might be a physical thing, but um, definitely. Uh, all right, so I think we've cleared out most of the chat questions. Um, let's see. Uh, I think Rose is having too much fun over there. <laughs> let's see um by the way super honest I, I i saw that you said that jake's your new online coach i remember that by the way <laughs> it's okay i'm not offended I, I was your coach to begin with <laughs> but um uh let's see so let's let's just start wrapping it up and if there's any last minute questions we'll dive in right there um so what advice would you give to archers out there um to just keep having fun because in the end that's what matters most um just enjoy your shooting and uh, if you want to get better at shooting you cannot do that without enjoying it so it works both ways um and it's uh yeah it seems simple but it's not really uh, that simple at times but remind yourself why you started doing the sport and why you keep coming back to it um is it because you want to prove something to yourself or uh, or to others, or is it simply because you enjoy shooting? Uh, and that's uh, that's something that I think is a a, a big thing. <clears throat> mm, that's huge. I fully agree. Remember why you started. Uh, it's great life advice to begin with for anything, any job, any any commitment. Um, I said the same for teaching. I said the same for archery. Remember why you did it. So that's great advice uh, for everyone out there. Um, some quick questions from chat here. Uh, what are key points for relaxed release? I just made a video about this pixel. Plugging myself here, but go on. <laughs> Sorry, what, what so, question so, was so, that? This from Pixel Dork. Uh, what are key points for a relaxed release? Oh yeah. Um, a relaxed release starts with a uh, solid hook on the string. Um, so. If you have a very shallow hook on the string and your uh, your fingers are like on the or the, the string is on the tips of your fingers, you need a lot of tension in your forearm to hold the string. Whereas if you have your fingers wrapped around the string in a way that you can still move your wrist and your hand and your hand is relaxed, um, you don't need as much tension in your forearm and that will make the release better as well. So um, even though it has to clear more uh, more skin more tissue uh, i think it will uh, pay off in the end mm. the, the other thing i've noticed too i said recently is that um you if you're using a finger tap of a spacer um sorry camera over here um then you should definitely be squeezing that spacer um if you uh you should be able to this is the drill you can do if you if you release and you don't have the strap on your uh tab you should still keep it in your hand on your release. So if you drop it, then that's not a relaxed release. Whereas if you release and without the uh, tab, uh, the strap, you can keep it in your fingers. That's a, a more of a sign that you've kept the right um, tension in your hand release. Uh, in my video, I mentioned you can hold a mobile phone. Um, if you don't want to break it, then don't use the phone. Just use your tab. Just take the strap off and practice shooting without a tab. All right. Uh, I think Rose is having way too much fun, and yet it draws very long. Just and your release is very quick too. I heard. So um, let's let's uh, wrap it up. Um, so uh, this is a chance for Swef to have any plugs. So any any uh, anything you want to tell your fans and viewers out there? Well, basically, if you're tuning into this and you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, uh, which is Triple Trouble Archery on YouTube, um, I would like it if you did that because. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we do a lot of time and effort into uh, getting videos out for you for free, um, and there is a lot of good information in there. Um, I'm sure that uh, yeah, David of uh, New Sensei uh, also has a lot uh, of good information on his channel. So uh, subscribe to that if you haven't subscribed to him. But um, yeah, I think uh, we make a good team in uh, making archery content on the web. So um, yeah, I hope you. Uh, 
subscribe to our channel as well. Yep, definitely. And if there's anything you want to see Swift do, because he can do things I can't do, like shoot a national team, <laughs> definitely uh, post on his channel, ask him. Um, it's, it's great to have Swift on board, of course. We have so much people from different experiences and backgrounds, and uh, we're all working towards our passion here, and I hope you all enjoyed our show today. Again, thank you, Swift, for coming on board. It's been great having you. Um, it's been a great chat too, and uh, hopefully all of you enjoyed this as well. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave in the comments below. Again, check out the um, check out uh, Triple Trouble Archery on YouTube uh, as well as their social media on Facebook and everything else um, it's been great thank you a lot and hopefully we will see you all next time take care everybody